Hello everyone and welcome to our Ask the Expert event. Today we will be learning about canning and jam making with expert Marisa McClellan. I'm Jackie Bruley, GBH host and lover of jam. Thanks to everyone that joined us today, including our Leadership Circle and RLS members. We appreciate your continued generous support so much. Before we get started, I would like to just say a friendly reminder that unlike us, you are not going to be on video and we will not be able to hear or see you but we still really want to hear your questions. If you have a question you wanna ask our expert, you have to open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type it in. As always, we would love to know where you're tuning in from. So when you submit your question, please be sure to let us know where you're watching the event. And if you see a question you really wanna hear the answer to, be sure to give it that thumbs up and it will go to the top of the Q&A list. To turn on the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen two transcription display options are going to pop up. Now we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen, but you can also choose full transcript. That's going to pull up a sidebar window where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. Now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Marisa McClellan. Marisa is a food blogger, cookbook author, and canning teacher based in Center City, Philadelphia. She is the author of Food and Jars, Preserving by the Pint, Naturally Sweet Food and Jars, and the Food and Jars Kitchen, Kitchen, and is the co-host of a podcast for obsessed home cooks called Local Mouthful. She has written for a variety of publications, including Fine Cooking, All Recipes, and Food 52. If you can find more of Marisa's jams, pickles, and preserves, all cooked up in her 80 square foot kitchen at foodandjars.com. Marisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. Um, let's just get started with sort of the broad question. How did you get into jamming in the first place? Uh, well, so I grew up doing a little bit of canning with my mom. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. And it's one of those places where stuff just kind of grows. So there were always blackberries and apples. Um, and so we'd always, you know, go picking and come home and make some jam. And then years later, I was living here in Philadelphia and I was in grad school. And I went to um, one day I blew off everything and went blueberry picking. And I came home with 13 pounds of blueberries. And, you know, that doesn't look like a lot when you're out in the field, but then you get it into your kitchen and you think, oh, this is a lot of blueberries. Um, and so I looked around and I thought, what should I do with all of these berries? And I thought, oh, I need to make some jam because that's, that's what you do when you have a lot of berries. <laughs> so I called my mom for an over the phone refresher because my parents still live in Portland. And um, I went out to the hardware store and bought some jars and the rest is history. There was just something about it that really connected with me. I loved the, I loved getting to remember the experience of picking those berries throughout the year. I actually really enjoyed the transformation that you experience when you um, combine fruit and sugar and apply heat. It's kind of magical the way it transforms. And I just, and I like the way it tasted. And so all of these things combined and I kept trying it. And um, before long, I was writing about it and and here we are, <laughs> 13 or 14 years later. Wow, that's amazing. So one overzealous, very picking trip led to all this. That's so great. Uh, yeah, you never know where life is going to take you. And my, my path has taken me to jam. I love it. Um, speaking of, you know, mysteries, uh, what's like the weirdest, strangest food you've ever made into a jam? Um, well... I have certainly done many savory jams. You know, when you think of jam, normally you think, you know, blueberry, strawberry, peach, fig, uh, but I do love doing tomato jam. And, and honestly, the tomato jam recipe on my website is the most popular thing I've ever published. So there are other people out there who like those savory jams. Uh, I've also done onion jams and uh, done, I, I think one of the other things that's kind of the most unusual is that I've done a lot of really, naturally sweet. So I wrote a whole book called Naturally Sweet Food and Jars, but um, in the process of writing that book, I did a lot of things where I was sweetening things with dates or with fruit juice concentrates. And um, that was that's fun because it gives you different flavors. And it's interesting how the sweetener becomes part of the flavor profile as opposed to sugar where, you know, it's just sweet. It, it brings a really nice added element of flavor and interest when you're using like dates to make something sweet. 
That so, yeah. actually takes us very neatly to our first question um, from Betsy, who asked, can you substitute maple syrup or honey for refined sugar in a recipe? Um, and if so, would that change the proportions in the recipe? So it, there's not a one size fits all formula for substituting maple syrup or honey. And honestly, I have to give a warning about maple syrup just to start out with. So one of the things when you're canning, um, when you're making anything that you're going to preserve in a water bath canner, you have to be very conscious of the acid content of the product because a you need to have a certain amount of acid to prevent um, botulism growth. So botulism spores can germinate in low acid environments. And so most fruit is high in acid. And so botulism is never a concern with um, you know, like yellow peaches or blueberries or blackberries, things like that. Uh, but when you pull in a sweetener like maple syrup, maple syrup is lower in acid. So it can actually tweak a recipe and potentially push it into an unsafe um, situation in terms of acid. So if you want to switch to a maple product for sweetening, I often recommend that you choose maple sugar, like the granulated product rather than the liquid, because it doesn't have the same impact on the finished acidity. So um, the only problem with that is it's more expensive and less um, easily available. So all that said, that's kind of my safety caveat. But if you do want to transition into um, a more naturally sweetened product using honey or maple sugar or um, fruit juice concentrates, things like that, the, you're going to probably need to employ um, a pectin that is designed for low sugar uh, canning because pectin is often activated by a sugar concentration. And so if you are okay with having a slightly runny jam and you're okay with using a goodly amount of honey, you can just, you, there are situations in which you can take a traditional sort of no additional pectin recipe and swap in, you use two thirds as much honey as a recipe would call for sugar, but that's still gonna be a lot of honey. And so you can do that and then boil it down and then be satisfied with a slightly less thick product. Or you can employ a product like Pomona's pectin, which is a really good low and no sugar pectin. And then you can use less honey and get a nice set. So it's like there are, there's no one size fits all path, but there are ways to do it. So I, that was a long answer, but I hope that that was helpful. That's great. And I love that there's a lot of variety in the final output. So you can really sort of tailor your jams to your taste. Maybe you want a really yeah. runny jam. Maybe you want a thick, solid one. Hey, I mean, <laughs> if you're the kind of person who's just pouring your jam into yogurt or oatmeal, yeah. things like that, then a runny jam is the best thing to have anyway. But if you're someone who's really wedded to the idea of jam on toast and it doesn't drip it off, off at all, then you need to employ something that's going to allow you to get that set. Gotcha. Great. Um, actually, in the same vein, our next question comes from Anna, who asks, um, I know that the pH and the acidity is really important. Um, commercially available fruits all are tested, but how do I know that it's safe to work with a regional fruit where I can't know for sure what the acidity content is because it's not vetted? Um, well, so there, there are lots of charts on the internet um, there's a really good website called Pick Your Own, and they have a pH chart on their website that is often my got my first sort of point of well, what's the general pH of this particular fruit that I'm working with? Because, um, you know, sometimes I don't know what the pH of, you know, sweet cherries is off the top of my head. And I, you know, I'm thinking about developing a recipe and I want to double check. And so I go to those charts online to see what the average pH of that particular fruit is. And as long as the average is pretty well below 4.6 pH. So if something is um, 4.6 4, 4 pH or below, that's considered high in acid. And if it's 4.7 or above, it's considered low in acid. So I, it's a little bit counterintuitive um, if you're not a scientist. And I, I, I'm not a scientist and I, it was counterintuitive to me when I first started doing this, um, that the high number is a low acid content and a low number is a high acid content. And so um, when you look at one of those charts and you're like, okay, I'm working with yellow peaches. I just want to double check their average pH, I think is something in the neighborhood of 3.3. That's well below that 4.6 cutoff. I can make any kind of jam I want with, um, you know, these yellow peaches. But if you're looking at something like, huh, I just, you know, came into a wealth of figs and I don't really know what the pH of figs is. Um, you go and look at that chart and you think, oh, look, 
figs, you know, they're somewhere like 4.8 to 5.2, that's above that cutoff. So if I wanna make something with figs, I'm going to have to really heavily acidify and I'm gonna to need to look at some tested recipes in order to determine how much acid to make to make some, to, um, how much acid to add to make a safe product. So, um, so I wouldn't be so concerned with like commercial versus locally grown produce because no matter the how it came to you, the produce is going to have sort of similar pH ranges. You know, it's like a yellow peach is going to have um, a similar pH range whether it came from the grocery store or your local grower. Um, but you just you know if you're inventing your own recipe, it's good to have a working knowledge of okay where is the pH of this particular variety falling, and do I need to look up a recipe and um, use those acidification guidelines in order to make something safe? Gotcha. Okay, so always check the guide before you make any calls. That makes sense to me. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. Uh, we've got a question from Brian in Boxborough who asks, "I have a huge amount of Concord grapes on my property." In the past, I have made jam from them, but removing the seeds one by one was so time consuming. Is there an easier way? Well, there is a reason why grape jelly is more popular than grape jam in terms of makers. It's because it's a lot easier to juice, you know, to extract juice from grapes than it is to um, get the seeds out. But you can make a nice jam, sort of like you can make a, a thing that is sort of a cross between a jam and a jelly. And that's what I typically do when I'm confronted with Concord grapes. And what I do is I pull them off the stems and I put them in a pot with a little bit of water and I just cook them until they're soft. And then I push them through a food mill, you know, like one of those hand crank ones um, so that you're getting some of the seed, like you're getting some of the skin and the pulp but you're not getting the seeds and like the really tough skins are staying behind. And so it creates something that is a little bit um, more textural than a jelly would be, but allows you to get those seeds out. Um, because yeah, those seeds are a pain to work with any other way, but that, that has been the easiest path forward that I have found. Um, but if you have tons of Concord grapes, it might be worth investing in a steam juicer, which is a tool that allows you to really easily extract all that juice and just leave all of the pulp or all of the seeds and skins and stems and stuff behind. Cool, okay. I like this idea of a jam jelly, a jamelli something yeah. like that. I don't know. We'll work, we'll workshop the name. Um, so a similar question about having a lot of something. Um, Beth asks, uh, I've got a bumper crop of figs coming in. Um, I would love any ideas that you have. And she is asking from Delaware. Very cool. Oh, uh, figs. Figs are amazing. They make wonderful jam. Like I said before, you need to be a little bit aware of um, adding plenty of acid to ensure that the pH is then pushed below that 4.6 cutoff. Um, but I love to do a fig and um, sort of marmalade mashup where I thinly slice a lemon or two and add it with the figs. And I do a ratio of one, um, two parts figs, one part sugar. It's a pretty high ratio, but it keeps it, it keeps the color really nice. Um, and so then I just simmer together the figs, the sugar, these um, pitted lemon slices with the peel and you get this sort of mar fig marmalade experience, which is really delicious. Um, I believe I have a recipe on my site for that. Um, I've also done fig with lemon and ginger. That's really great. Um, I have a recipe in my preserving by the pint book for fig quarters preserved in a whiskey syrup. That's pretty darn delicious. If that's your sort of thing. Um, I, I love a fig butter. I mean, if you have a bumper crop, if you have tons of figs, it's delicious to just puree the fresh figs, pour them to a slow cooker, and then just cook them down low. You wanna make sure that, you know, when you put the lid on, you kind of set it sideways or cock it or put a spoon or a wooden chopstick across the rim of the slow cooker so the lid can vent so the water can evaporate out. But then you can cook those figs down into butter and lightly sweeten it um, with a little bit of sugar or honey and then add some lemon juice or orange juice is another one. Um, figs and orange go really beautifully together. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, I've done a fig and vanilla that's really great um, with vanilla bean paste because then you get like the seeds of the vanilla bean paste with the seeds of the figs and they kind of complement each other. Um, so those are some ideas. I hope that's helpful. Figs are delicious. I do have, I, I know I have like a handful of fig recipes on my website. So that might be a good starting place as well. Great advice. Okay. Um, oh, this is an interesting sort of two part question from Cindy who asks any advice for making sugar free jam, particularly in an instant pot? 
which I feel like is the new, very popular cooking gadget that, that everyone has these days. Okay. Let me talk about Instant Pots first and then we'll go to sugar-free jam. So gotcha. an Instant Pot has limited application when it comes to jam making because so much of jam making is evaporation. You know, you're evaporating out the water content to concentrate the sugars and create something that's kind of thick and um, flavor forward. And an Instant Pot, when used as a pressure cooker, doesn't allow for evaporation. So I have used an Instant Pot in some scenarios for to make peach butter, for instance. I have done it in the past where I cut my peaches up into quarters, I leave the skins on, and this is where the Instant Pot does do you well, is that, and then I apply just one or two minutes of high pressure and it softens those peach skins so that you can puree them really easily. And then I use the slow cooker function on the Instant Pot to cook it into a fruit butter. But um, to make like a true jam in an Instant Pot is really kind of a no-go. It just doesn't, it's not the right tool for the job. Um, it's a good prep tool, but not necessarily a good um, finishing tool. And then if you're making a sugar-free jam, so there are, it, so it's hard. Jam by definition is something that includes up like by at minimum 65% sugar. So like if you want to make an actual jam, it's not going to, you can't make like a true jam with no sugar. You can make spreads with um, non-sugar sweeteners or with something like a fruit juice concentrate and create something that's going to be relatively satisfying. But when, as soon as you reduce or remove the sugar, you lose one of your thickening tools and you lose one of your preservatives. And so sugar, what it does when is it absorbs the water content in the fruit and in the jam. And if there's no water available that you can't have microorganism growth, you don't have color loss. And so when you make a sugar-free preserve of any kind, you either need to embrace the brown or you um, <laughs> need to eat it very quickly. Um, it also, they just succumb to mold more quickly, even, um, even with like, even if you um, make them and you keep them in the refrigerator, there's just not as much there to prevent microorganism growth. So when I make a very low sugar or no sugar preserve, I often can it in those very small four ounce jars. So you have a very little open that you can lose if it goes moldy before you can finish it. Um, but I would, I, again, if you want to make a really satisfying spread without any sugar and you're swapping in some non-sugar sweetener or you're using a small amount of dried fruit or fruit juice concentrate, I'm gonna shout Pomona's pectin out again because it's a really useful product and they have a number of recipes on their website that do that. That, I mean, they're, they have really embraced the niche of low and no sugar sweetening and um, have really developed a lot of recipes. So that's a really good product if that's the direction you wanna go. And I, they don't sponsor me. I have no skin in that game. It's just a really useful product. Nice, always good to have uh, vetted products and things like this. <laughs> um, so this is a question from a mysterious anonymous attendee who asks, I would like to try a small batch marmalade from your website but I don't want to go through the water bath processing. Would it be okay to freeze the jars once they're cooled? Yes, but um, if you want to freeze them, you have to choose jars that don't have shoulders. Here, look, I have an example. This, oh, I'm drinking my water out of this jar right here, right now. And this is a regular mouth jar. And as you can see, it's got shoulders. And so you never want to freeze in a jar that has shoulders because when the product um, freezes, it expands. And if it, as it expands, it pushes up against the shoulders and it causes breakage. So you want to opt for a jar that is straight sided. So either um, a regular mouth half pint, a wide mouth half pint, or a wide mouth pint jar are going to be your options if you want to freeze anything. Like you can always freeze something. And here's the secret. You'd never have to can something that, like you never have to can jam. Jam is finished when it is done cooking. We simply can it to preserve its shelf life and mean that you don't have to keep it in the fridge or the freezer. So you don't have to keep expending energy to um, keep it good. But if you're only making a small amount and you're not interested in the canning process, you never have to can something, you know, that you've made that you preserved. Jams, chutneys, pickles, they all can go in the fridge. Like you, there's no like cult of canning you must can. You don't <laughs> have to can it if you don't want to. 
I like this answer. It frees us from the fear of the water bath. That's fantastic. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, our next question is coming from Louise in Somerville, um, who asks, what do you suggest for seeded, like a raspberry, or stringy, like a rhubarb fruits? Okay, um, so in the sense that those, you, you don't like the seediness and you don't like the stringiness and you want to make things that you don't have to deal with that. That's my guess, um, yeah. Yeah, so with raspberries, so I, I mean, typically I don't ever get enough raspberries to where I want to lose any of them. And so I often embrace the, the seediness of raspberries, but growing up in the Pacific Northwest, we had so many wild blackberries that were so seedy. And growing up, my mom would, before she made, before she cooked blackberries into jam, she would blitz them in a blender and then tediously push them through a fine mesh sieve in order to get all of the seeds out before she made jam. And so again, it's more like that jam jelly hybrid because it's a little bit smooth, but it's still got some texture, but it makes the most delicious jam because you get all the flavor of those blackberries while um, not ever having to you know, contend with seeds. So if you have the patience, that is, that's the really and truly the best way to seed those seedy fruits is to blitz them so that they're sort of smooth and you push them through a fine mesh sieve with like a back of a like rubber or silicone spatula so that you can really work it through. Um, and then you can also use the seeds that you've left behind for um, vinegar. I often, if I do that, if I seed a fruit, I then put the seeds in a jar and cover it with apple cider vinegar and let it steep for a while. And you get all of the flavor from the seeds into your vinegar. And then it becomes something you can use for like a, you know, blackberry or raspberry vinaigrette. It's kind of fun and fancy or shrub. Um, so that's, that's really the best way to handle um, a seedy berry, but rhubarb. There, I feel like, I mean, the, the, the stringiness of rhubarb is kind of part of its charm, but if you don't want it, you could also always chop it really fine or puree it. Um, one of the things that I've done with some jams in the past is I make a Meyer lemon and rhubarb marmalade. And so one of the things I do is I, I kind of divide the rhubarb in half. And so the first half of it, I stew with the um, lemons so that it gets really soft and then you don't really have to contend with much of those stringiness that's not really a word stringy <laughs> nature there we go yeah. um, and then I take the other part and I slice it super fine and I introduce that at the very end of cooking so you get um, rhubarb sort of in two ways you get a little bit of the texture but it's thin it's so thinly sliced that again the stringiness is kind of not an issue um, but yeah you could also Rhubarb butter is another way to go. So you could cook the rhubarb down with like some orange juice and then puree it and cook it down some more and make sort of a really nice spreadable um, butter. And that that process will um, eradicate the stringiness. Oh, my phone is ringing. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, but that, that's kind of the best thing I can uh, suggest for that. Great, okay. So very small slices or just stew forever and ever until it's just soft. Yes. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Um, here's kind of a technical question uh, from Suzanne who asks, can all fruits be jammed without pectin? And is there a typical replacement for pectin if you don't want to use it? Lemons? Well, so it's sort of a philosophical question because at, so pectin is the fiber that holds up the cell walls of fruits and vegetables. So everything has it, um, you know, to some degree or another. And even if you use like lemons to replace the pectin, then you're just extracting lemon pectin from the lemons and adding pectin. So um, one way or another, you're getting, like if you're working with a very low pectin fruit that sort of something that's naturally low in pectin, like the rhubarb we were just talking about, um, and you need to give it a big boost, like you could, you know, add orange, add lemon, you don't want to use traditional pectin, um, or you can, make your own pectin stock. Like we're in the time of year right now where green apples as an underripe apples are available. Like if you have an apple tree in your neighborhood, you can go pick a bunch of underripe apples. And if you cook those apples down and take the liquid that is um, left over, that becomes um, pectin stock. And you can can it because it's very high in acid. You don't have to add sugar. It's basically like a, 
um, unsweetened apple jelly. And that can be also used as a pectin product in jamming. I've never done that because I live um, in the middle of center city, Philadelphia. So my access to uh, green apples is sort of limited, but I know uh, there are a number of recipes online for that sort of thing. And so if you don't want to use commercial pectin, you could certainly make your own pectin stock that way. Um, I've also seen people do that same thing with lemons where they cook lemons down and then take the water. And it's basically like a, a runny lemon, unsweetened lemon jelly that then, then they then use to boost the pectin. Um, so one way or another, we're talking about pectin, but it's really a matter of, do you want to use commercial pectin or do you wanna to go to the work of extracting it from another fruit in order to add it to your jam? And you certainly can do that. Gotcha, okay. Um, another pectin question, actually. Uh, this is from Barbara in Connecticut, who asks, um, can you tell us again the name of that low sugar pectin that you mentioned earlier? And what are the differences between a powdered and a liquid for a pectin? Okay, um, so the pectin brand that um, I've recommended a couple of times is Pomona, P-O-M-O-N-A apostrophe S, um, like the university in California. Um, and you often find it at natural food stores. Um, so like if you have a, a natural food store in your neighborhood, that's probably gonna be your, your best bet. You can also order it online. Um, there, it's a company that's based in California, it's family owned. So, you know, it's a, it's a good one to support. Um, as far as, I'm sorry, what was the second half of the question? It's flown out of my brain. Oh, anyway, one second. I'm going to another tab. Um, I'm so sorry. Do, no, it's okay. Um, oh, I've lost it. And I'm trying to remember what it was. Uh, da, 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 da. This is Barbara from I'm sorry, I couldn't hold on to it. I found it. Uh, what are the differences between powdered and liquid? There we go. <laughs> so... Um, off it, so powdered, I mean, they're essentially the same in that they are, all pectin is extracted from, you know, even commercial pectin is extracted from either citrus or apples, typically. Um, liquid pectin is often used in a scenario where you don't want to risk clumps. So it's more often used in um, jellies, things where you don't want to have any potential where the pectin will hit the cooking fruit and seize up as opposed to integrating into the product. Um, so they can, and they can be used fairly interchangeably. I used to be a really um, big liquid pectin fangirl. And over the years, I've really switched my technique and switched to powdered in large part because seven or eight years ago, um, a couple of the companies who made liquid pectin changed the formulation and it didn't work as well. It just wasn't setting up as firmly as I wanted it to. And I found that I could more reliably get that same sort of set with powdered pectin. Um, and so I made the switch. I, when it comes to like commercial powdered pectin, most of the time these days, I, what I do is I take the powdered pectin and I mix it into the sugar before I add the sugar to the fruit. And what that does is that it Distribu distributes it well and prevents that dreaded clumping that you might experience. And so for me, that's how I've made the, po the powdered pectin work better for me. Gotcha, okay. That's good to know. All right, so you can use both, but there are pros and cons. Got it, okay. Um, this is great. We have a question from a youthful jammer. Um, the question is, hi, this is Rowan, I am 10. What is the best fruit for jam? truly the best fruit for jam is the fruit you like the most or the fruit that you have a glut of. Um, but if you want something that's going to be reliable, it's going to set up well, that um, especially if you're a new canner um, or a new jam maker and you want something that's not going to lead you astray, I find that blueberries are really a good starter fruit because blueberries are naturally very high in pectin they're easy to come by. There's not a lot of prep involved. You know, you're not peeling and seeding. All you need to do to prepare blueberries for jam making is wash them and, you know, pick over to make sure there aren't any gross ones in there and then crush them. And so it's, it's an easy, satisfying experience because, you know, when you're crushing them, you either crush them with your hands or use potato masher and really go in there. And so um, it's a fun, satisfying experience. And then because of that natural pectin, they're gonna, it's gonna give you something that sets up and spreads well. Um, 
I also really like Ital the Italian um, prune plums, you know, the ones that come into season this time of year and are sort of elongated and have sort of a yellow interior and a really dark purple exterior. Those are really high in pectin naturally. And they're the sort of fruit that tastes better cooked than it does fresh. And that's a great fruit for jam making because you're going to really get a lot. It's going to have a wow factor because you're going to take a bite of one when they're fresh and you think, oh, this is, yeah. and then you <laughs> take a taste of that jam and you think, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So that's another very satisfying one. And those are in season right now. So that's a good fruit to go for because um, we've got probably two or three weeks of sort of prime pl prune plum season. And so they make a really good one as well. I love it. Oh, that sounds really good. Now I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> our next come question comes from uh, Cynthia from Redfield, Maine, who asks, are there any tips on adding alcohol to jam like champagne? Yes, so um, champagne is a little bit trickier. There's, I have, uh, I have sort of a handful of really good tips um, on adding like booze or liqueurs <laughs> to jam because those always go in at the end of cooking. Um, you don't want to add, you don't want to add them early on in the cooking process because they, the flavor will evaporate out with the steam, the water from the fruit. So when it comes to adding like, um, you know, bourbon or some sort of liqueur to your finished jam, you add it right at the end of cooking, just long enough to cook off the alcohol without cooking out the flavor. Um, as far as champagne goes, champagne is better added to a jelly than a jam because when you're making jam, you're a big part of your goal is to evaporate out the water. And if you add something like champagne, you're adding a lot of liquid back or in order to get that flavor that you're then going to have to cook out again. So um, I really like, I have a recipe in my first cookbook for a mimosa jelly. So it's part orange juice, part um, champagne. And that's like the ideal application for champagne or Prosecco, something like that, because it like you're starting with liquid, a lot of liquid, and you're adding pectin to thicken it. So you're going to get the impact from the champagne. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily add champagne to jam. Another application for something like champagne or red wine would be when you're canning fruit. So you can add that to the syrup and create a different flavor in your syrup that then infuses the fruit. So canned, canned whole fruits and jellies are the better application for champagne and jam is a better place for like bourbon or, you know, um, I'm not a big drinker, so I can't actually even name um, liqueurs off the top of my head right now, but like you, those are the places, you, those are really good for jam where you just wanna add that flavor boost at the end of cooking. Awesome, okay, that's really good to know. Um, our next question comes from Jean in Needham, who says, when I make red pepper jelly, it is always too hard or too soft. What am I doing wrong? Help. <laughs> Um, so set is hard. Like, first of all, set is hard. Like, don't beat yourself up about it because every year the conditions are different. It might be a more humid day one day when you're cooking it, the next year it might be drier. Like the atmosphere can play a role in your finished outcome because if it's a really humid day, it's harder to cook enough liquid out of your product in order to get that proper set. Um, and if it's a really dry day, it's going to cook faster. And so you just, you know, give yourself a little bit of um, forgiveness and grace if it's not setting out, setting up exactly how you want it to, because even I struggle with that. Um, and I have made thousands, thousands of jars of preserves, and I still struggle with set at times. So, um, but all that said, there are a few things you can do. You can keep an eye on the temperature of the cooking jam. So typically the set point is reached at 220 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can clip a candy thermometer onto your pot and keep an eye on the temperature. That said, don't just rely on the temperature. You also want to be using your eyes and your ears and your smell because um, you, those things will also give you cues. And I have found that people get too wedded to their thermometers and it's burning in front of them. And they're like, but it hasn't reached the set point. I'm like, <laughs> it has, your thermometer is perhaps not giving you the right reading or it's not inserted deeply enough into the jam to give you a true reading. So, you know, don't always just trust technology but it can be a useful tool 
in sort of your toolbox of things that will get you to the proper set. Um, you can also use the um, droplet test where when you think it's getting to the point where it's going to set up, you take the pot off the heat. This is important. You don't let it keep cooking while you're testing for set. And you, uh, before you start cooking, you put a couple of saucers or little bowls in your freezer. So you take one of those frozen bowls out, you put a dollop of your, your pepper jelly on the frozen bowl, you put it back in the freezer for a minute and take it out again. And then you nudge that little droplet with the tip of your finger. And if it wrinkles, if it's formed a skin and it wrinkles as you nudge it, that's a good sign that you've reached the set point. If your finger slides right through and just kind of draws a line, you need more cooking. So those are tools that you can use, techniques to determine if you're getting to the right point. Um, you, the other thing I like to do is as I stir, I scrape the walls of the pot and I look at how it looks on my spatula. So if it's looking thicker on my spatula, that's a good indication that we're getting to the set point. Um, but if, it, if it's runny, then it's not. But if you're, so these are all things to do if it's often being too liquid. If it's setting up too firmly, um, it could be that you're relying too heavily on the timing in the instructions. Like a lot of recipes will say, boil for one minute, boil for three minutes, boil for five minutes. Um, you also need to use your judgment, even if it says boil for five minutes after you've added the pectin, because it, five minutes might be too much, especially if you're using a really wide pan where you have a lot of surface area. So that a lot of evaporation is happening that could be leading you to a too firm set. So there's no, one size fits all answer here, but there are a number of kind of things that you can add to your practice that will help you improve. Okay. Well, there have been so many great questions from you guys so far in the audience, and thank you for sending those in. Um, we're gonna get back to some, some more in a minute. Um, but first, I wanna take a moment to introduce my colleague, Mark. Uh, welcome, Mark. Nice to be here. Thanks uh, so much for jamming out with us today while learning canning techniques with author and expert Marisa McClellan during this Ask the Expert jamming event. You know, viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to experience the joy of jam making, keeping up with the latest news, or simply to be entertained for a while. If GBH is your go-to source for baking, culture, news, and entertainment, we're asking you to please make a donation Today, if you give $7.50 a month as a GBH sustainer or $90 all at once, we'll say thank you with a signed copy of Marissa, Marissa McClellan's book, The Food in Jars Kitchen. Her book is covering much of what we're discussing today and it provides helpful tips on canning and jam making. You know, your support will ensure that we can continue to bring you events and discussions just like this in the months ahead. So please visit us at gbh.org slash support events to make a donation in any amount, or simply click on the support link in the chat tab below. Or if you have a, a smartphone, you can text the letters GBH to 800-204-3811 to make a donation. You can also scan the QR code located right here over my left shoulder that's on your screen. Either way you choose, the giving just takes a few minutes of your time and a few dollars on your credit card. It really might be the best use of your time today. We thank you so much if you're already a GBH member. If you wish to become one, just click on the support link in the chat tab now or text the letters GBH to 800-204-3811 to make your donation. Now let's get back to canning with Marisa McClellan. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and as Mark said, really, we, we are so thankful for all of your support. Um, you really are what makes us able to make events like this happen. So um, thank you for everyone who is already a donor. And if you're not, like, hey, what do you have to lose? You get a really cool canning thing. Um, so uh, let's get back to some of your questions. Uh, here's what we've got. Mary asks, are there any fruits that should not be used to make jam? Um. There are some fruits that are traditionally too low in acid to make jam without heavily acidifying. So those things are um, white peaches, white nectarines, um, figs, melon, Asian pear, and pawpaws, if you live in a place where pawpaws grow, um, and tomatoes. But all of those things can be acidified to be made safe. But like 
you just need to be aware of that and take into account the fact that you need to add either citric acid or bottled lemon juice to those products to ensure that they are safe for canning. Um, it mostly comes in where people are like, oh, I have this peach jam recipe I love, but I only have white peaches this year. I'm just gonna make a, peach, a white peach jam. That's the sort of thing where you just need to be a little bit conscious of the fact that you need to add um, additional acid. But there's not a lot that you, like there's not a list of like never make jam <laughs> from these things. It's more like you can, but you need to be careful and cautious and take extra precautions in order to use these particular fruits. Gotcha, okay. So there, the sky really is the limit, just be careful. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this next question, actually speaking of melon, uh, comes from Terry, who asks, uh, I made watermelon jam and it was too sweet. And there are a lot of O's in that too. How do I lower the sugar content? Um, this is another situation where you're going to have to employ a low or no sugar pectin like Pomona's pectin. You can also use the ball or um, shore gel low pectin, pec low fruit low sugar pectins in this scenario as well. They do work. Um, I mean, basically you need, you need to find a lower sugar recipe and just, you know, use one of those lower sugar pectins. Um, I have made watermelon jelly in the past. I have a recipe for it on my website. It is not my favorite jelly, but I took it down once because I thought, you know, I don't want to have a recipe I don't love personally. And I got so much like people like, where did the watermelon jelly go? But I put it back up because it had a certain contingent of people who loved it. Um, so you can find, you can make ones that are lower in sugar. You're just gonna have to use a pectin that's designed to set with lower, lower amounts of sugar. Okay, um, next question comes from Val in Cincinnati. Uh, and Val asks, I have some quiches that aren't getting very ripe and soft. Would they still work for jam or is that not ideal? You, when it comes to jam making, the rule of thumb really is that if it doesn't taste good eating it, it's not gonna necessarily make good jam. You can't save bad fruit with jam making. You know, you, if it's underripe, if it's overripe, it's not going to, like those qualities are gonna translate into the jam. Now that said, if they're just, if, if they are, I, I would suggest, cutting one open and tasting it. And if it's really crunchy and it doesn't have much flavor, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't even try because it's not, you're not going to get, like, it's not going to magically transform into something delicious um, if you turn it into jam. But I mean, you can keep waiting them out and see if they ripen. You can put them in a bag with a banana and see if that helps. Um, but lousy fruit in quantity doesn't make good jam. It just, it doesn't. It's not, it's one of those unfortunate things. I mean, it's, I use a lot of seconds in jam making. So like those are the things that aren't perfect for like the grocery store. I get them from farmers. They may have blemishes. That's fine. Like imperfect fruit is great for jam. Lousy fruit is not. <laughs> An important distinction there for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, our, our next question is from, I think Sadie is how this is supposed to be pronounced. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, are there alternatives to pectin like a chia seeds or something that you can use for that thickening vibe? You can use chia seeds to thicken fruit into a spread, but it's not gonna be safe for canning. So if you wanna create something that you can make, you can can and make shelf stable, chia seeds are not gonna work. Um, you can certainly use them to make like a no cook freezer jam or something that goes in the fridge, but, um, there really is nothing else that works like pectin for um, jam making. There's just, it's, there's just not, unfortunately. Gotcha, okay, good to know. Um, we have a question now from Beth who says, hi Marisa, it's lovely to see you today. Um, could you please talk a little bit more about how weather and humidity can affect processing jam? I find it sometimes takes longer to hit a good consistency if it's really muggy outside or humid. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if it's really muggy, really humid, there's more moisture in the air. Um, and so that can make it harder to cook the moisture out of the fruit. It also can inform you, like if you're going through a season, like if you're getting your fruit locally and it's been a really humid, rainy summer, chances are that that fruit is going to have a little bit more water in its flesh also, and perhaps might be a little less sugar concentration. So, you know, if it's dry and it's sunny, you get a higher sugar concentration in the fruit. If it's very wet, 
um, and not as sunny, you get a lower sugar concentration. So if it's been a really moist, humid summer without a lot of um, sun, you might get fruit that doesn't, doesn't have as much sugar in it naturally. So you're already sort of at a disadvantage because when you're making jam, the goal is to cook enough water out of the fruit that you elevate the sugar concentration in the pot to a point where the sugar can start elevating the temperature. So what's happening is that sugar has the ability to cook up above the boiling point. And so as you reduce the water content, increase the sugar concentration, your um, temperature inside the pot starts to ratchet up. And so that's how you get to that 220 degree Fahrenheit point, which is the point at which sugar starts to gel. And as it gels, it bonds with the pectin, either pectin you've added or natural, um, the pectin that's natural to the fruit, and it creates a set. So if you can't, like if it's a really humid day, it's gonna be harder to cook that water out of the fruit in order to increase that sugar concentration and get to the set point. Now, a lot of, and I will say that that's if you're making traditional jam. So you're using a traditional sort of higher sugar um, ratio and you're using um, like a traditional um, fruit pectin. If you're using a lower no sugar pectin, a lot of that is moot in the sense that you will still get a set with those lower no sugar pectins, but you still may have a flatter flavor because the fruit still has more water in it. So I often recommend that if you're using a lower no sugar pectin and you're noticing that the fruit is a little flat, that really you wanna boost it with some lemon juice, you wanna add maybe a splash of a delicious vinegar um, or add extra spices, something, because if, if the fruit's a little bit flat in the pot, it's gonna be a little bit flat as jam. And so you wanna add some things to kind of boost the flavor and compensate for that. So as a bonus into that, that I've inserted into that question. I like it. It's also so funny because it's a nice thing that jam is a food that tastes similar, like as you're making it to how it's going to be later. So you don't have to have that guesswork of will it turn out okay. Yeah, nice. absolutely. Um, ooh, we have a question about peaches. I'm excited about that. Okay, so Mary from Mansfield, who um, starts her question by saying, I use a food mill to remove seeds and do the skins when I do conquered grapes, which is nice to hear that that method is, is utilized by our listeners today. Um, yep. So Mary's question, uh, I get too much juice and too few peaches in each jar when I preserve them, they're floating and it tastes good, but I want it to be more fruity, how? So are we, we're talking about preserved like peach hats, right? She's put it like, does she call out syrup and Okay, I think that's what she's talking. I think okay. so, yeah. I okay. So here is the, I am a hot pack evangelist. Now I realize this is a crazy thing to be excited about, but <laughs> I used to can my peaches where I would take the peeled peaches and fit them into the jars and then pour syrup on top. And the peaches had only been blanched; they hadn't had a lot of heat exposure, and I would end up with two inches of syrup at the bottom and all the fruit floating up top and not as much fruit in the jars as I wanted to. And then I switched to the hot pack technique where you heat up your syrup, you have your jars in your canning pot and you, as you peel your peaches, I do them in quarters because they go into the jars more easily. So as I peel my peaches, I cut them into quarters and I slip them into the syrup. And so by the time all my peaches are peeled, they're all heated through in that syrup. And what's happening is that as they heat through the peach segments are releasing some of the air that they keep trapped in their the fiber of their flesh. And so as they release that air, they take on a little bit of the syrup, they become a little denser. They're going, you're gonna get more in the jar and you're not gonna have as much fruit float because you have helped the fruit release their air. So they're not gonna float because they're not gonna be lighter than the syrup. It, the finished texture it difference between a hot pack and a cold pack is negligible and the finished product is so much better. So I, I, I feel a little silly being this excited about hot packing your peaches, but let me tell you, <laughs> it is, it is life changing. I highly recommend it. So um, if you've been cold packing your hat, your peach has try hot packing them. It's going to be, it's going to change your peach process forever. That is a big promise and I love it. And I also love how much science went into that answer. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, oh man, okay, that's that just made me happy. All right, so this question is um, from Steve in Alston who asks, um, my brother loves growing spicy peppers. Can they just be added to a jam to make it spicy? Yes, but so, 
you can't just take any jam recipe and chop up a bunch of peppers and add it because you're adding a low acid ingredient to something and you don't know what it's going to do to the finished acid of the jam. So here's what I do when I'm trying. You could use a, an acidified like hot pepper jam or jelly recipe and employ those peppers, that would work. But if you just wanna make a spicy fruity jam, what I will often do is take the peppers and cut a couple slits in the side so that, as, and then I drop those slitted peppers in so that as the jam cooks, some of the flavor and heat from the peppers imparts its, its you know, essence into the fruit, but you can then pluck those finished peppers out so that you're not adding material that could impact the acid. And so to my mind, that's the best way to just take a traditional jam and make it spicy with fresh peppers. Um, you can also, if you wanna to go to the trouble, you can dry the peppers and grind them and make your own um, pepper powder and then add that because a dried product doesn't impact acidity the same way a fresh one does. And so those are kind of the two roads you could take there. Um, there are also um, recipes out there for hot pep or you know, a spicy jam that add additional acid to compensate for the acid hit that a pepper, chopped up pepper can um, impart on the jam. Excellent. Okay, so we've got three good solutions there. Take to look for a recipe or just, you know, hack it together. Yeah. I like that. Um, <laughs> oh, here's a good question from Nancy who asks, is there a way to check the pH level if I want to slightly change a recipe? Can I do that? You can, but it typically requires a little bit more equipment than the average home cook has. So there are two ways to test the pH of something. You can either use litmus paper, those you know pH testing strips that people often have around for the swimming pool, yeah. or you can use a pH meter. Now, the those um, pH strips are unfortunately not typically as sensitive as one might like right in the range we need them to be. So they're not often as sensitive as you need in that 4.6 pH range. Additionally, um, pH levels in a jar can change over time. So ideally, if you are making something and you're tweaking the recipe and you wanna te test the pH, you have to make it, can it, wait two or three weeks, puree one of the jars and then test that puree. And that's the way you're gonna get the, a true safe reading, which is often a lot more than people wanna go through because then if it's not safe, you have four or five jars of something that you have to throw away. Um, you can get a pH meter and um, use that because you can get the testing solutions that are sensitive in different areas. And so you can buy the testing solution that is sensitive in the range you want, um, but it's just, it's, it's a fiddly process. So if you are comfortable with a pH meter and testing pH, you know, if you work in a lab, you know, sure. But yeah. if you're just um, an average home cook who doesn't even know what a pH meter looks like, it might not be what the direction you wanna go in. I will say that there are um, a couple of books out there. They're, they're called Putting Up and Putting Up More. Um, they came out maybe a decade ago and they were written by a professional, like a jam maker and a preserver who had a professional business making things. And he has instructions on testing pH in his book that are fairly extensive. So if that is a direction you wanna go, those two books will be of service. Okay. And those books again are called Putting Up and then Putting Up More is the second one. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, our next question comes from Nina in Ashland who says, can organic sugar be substituted one for one for refined sugar? Yeah, absolutely. There's no difference. Great. I like the quick, easy questions too. That's <laughs> check. Um, okay, so question uh, here from Nancy who says, I just raw packed plum tomatoes with no added liquid in the pressure cooker. I packed the jars as much as I could without crushing the tomatoes, but there was a lot of seal space. The seal in all the jars was good. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. If they look ugly. You have a lot of, you probably have some water separation from the pulp. The top of the tomatoes is probably looking a little leathery. Um, the pressure canner is a really intense you know, environment and tomatoes don't like an intense environment. So they respond <laughs> by getting a little funky, but it's perfectly safe. And um, you, know, you can either scrape off that top level of sort of tomato leather that's on top of the jars or 
just kind of, you know, shake it back in. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I pressure canned tomatoes once and I really didn't like the outcome. So I water bath my tomatoes and acidify them, even though it takes longer, I like the finished product better. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, sometimes that trade-off is hard to decide. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got a question here from Alyssa who asks, kind of a side question to jamming. Um, do you have any go-to recipes for how to use your finished jam? So aside from jam bars or oatmeal ideas? That's what my whole book is about. Uh, <laughs> so um, this book, which is the pledge um, reward, it has, so my food and jars kitchen book has 140 recipes for using, um, using up preserves. It also has in the back instructions for canning and my dozen sort of best preserve recipes. But if you are looking to use things up, it's got recipes for baked goods. It's got recipes for salads, vinaigrettes, marinades, um, ways to transform them into savory dishes. Like I spent a year and a half coming up with every possible way I could think to transform your homemade pantry into dinner. And so um, it's, it's all in there. Um, I would say that like, if you just want some easy suggestions right now, a vinaigrette is also always a great way to use up jam because you can add sweetness and flavor to something that's very basic and you can either shake it up in the end of the jar. You know, it's like if you have just a spoonful left in the bottom of the jar, you add your oil, your vinegar, your salt, maybe a crushed garlic clove, a little bit of mustard, you shake it all up and you suddenly have, you know, plum vinaigrette. You, another one that's great is if you have like jam that turned out to be a little bit runny, you can incorporate it into a smoothie. You can um, mix it with whole milk yogurt and freeze it and turn it into frozen yogurt. Like there's just so many things you can do. Jam, preserves, they're endlessly versatile, endlessly. Well, I can't think of a better way to end than on that note. <laughs> that was perfect. Um, Thank you all so much for joining us today. It was such a fun conversation. Your questions were fantastic and I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, Marisa, is there a place people can come to connect with you and maybe get more of those jam tips, thoughts, ideas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my website is foodandjars.com. I'm on Instagram at foodandjars. And I also have a Facebook community group that you can get to through the Food and Jars website um, where you can come and talk to other canners. Um, there's like 16,000 people in there and we, people ask questions and we all answer them and it's very friendly and um, collegial and kind. And so it's a good place to uh, come and hang out and talk about jam making and canning with other people who are obsessed. Perfect. So we've got a great place to jam out. That's my only jam pun I'll do today. Um, thank you all again for coming. We had such a wonderful time and um, don't miss future Ask the Expert events and uh, get that book. It's really cool. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs>